Syracuse transfer Malik Brown will visit Duke starting tomorrow. It's a three-day visit uh, for the Orange. Average just under 10 points, nine boards last year, but he's a stretch, stretch three. It's 6'8". He shoots 36% from three. It is precisely the kind of player that this Duke basketball team would like to add to its 2024-2025 roster, considering the announcements in the last 24 or so hours in which the backcourt for the Duke Blue Devils, Caleb Foster and Tyrese Proctor, decided, you know what, let's run it back one more year. Much like last year, remember, when we got the announcements from Kyle Filipowski after he, uh, prior to having the hip surgery, and we get Jeremy Roach coming back this year, it's Caleb Foster and Tyrese Proctor's turn. They talked about the brotherhood, and with the brotherhood, Caleb Foster suggesting, I wasn't going nowhere. I mean, me personally, like, I, I'm not really in that, you know. I mean, I, I've, I chose a school that chose Duke, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a thousand percent committed to Duke, and, um, I mean, yeah, can't really, I can't yeah, really speak for the others. I so, agree. like, I mean, I, mean, I can't really that. see myself playing anywhere else. One thousand percent committed. And well, it just feels like there was a lot of le- there was a lot of meat left on the table, a lot of meat left on the bone for him this past season. After so? he did get injured in that game against Wake Forest okay. and missed his first NCAA tournament, and at one point, especially during the non-conference portion of the season, I remember there was a I can't remember what game it might have been their game against Baylor at Madison Square Garden, where it was kind of the Caleb Foster and Jerry yep. McCain yeah, show. The, it was a big showcase for it was a showcase night for him there. Yeah. So a lot of there was a lot of potential that we saw out of Caleb Foster in a big game like that throughout the non-conference or th- yeah throughout the non-conference portion of the schedule, and then we didn't really get to see. I'm not going to say hit its full hit its full potential, but we never saw what we definitely we didn't see what Caleb Foster could have done similar to what we saw of Jerry McCain in the NCAA tournament due to his injury. So Foster coming back, Tyrese Proctor coming out and saying he's going to return as well, which is. Good news for fans of of Proctor and certainly for the Blue Devils. Why did he want to come back? He explains. I mean, mine was sort of similar to last year, just meeting with my circle, my family, agents, coaches, and just talking about, you know, what's best for my future. And, um, I mean, it always – I mean, it really just comes down to me, what I feel comfortable with. Um, And I feel like the best decision for me and what I'm most comfortable is coming back for another year. And, and, um. You know, going further than we did last year, and um, I think it's it's the right decision, and I'm I'm happy I made it. How quickly last year was, right? That was like two weeks ago. Yeah, <laughs> last year, but a lot has changed, right? The portal's open. Guys have declared for the draft. Kyle Filipowski is is out. Mark Mitchell has decided that he's going to hit the portal. We're losing a couple more, and so for Duke, and you know Foster and Proctor, that's a big backcourt, right? Couple six five guys. We discussed that just a little bit yesterday. If Malik Brown decides to show up, he's a stretch three. They've got a big recruiting class in, you know, guys that may not be able to step in right away, but then you do have guys that are going to step in right away. Cooper Flagg, obviously, came in Malawak, uh, which is the way I've heard it pronounced by PA announcers during FIBA. I was going to say thank you for taking a crack at it because I, I certainly wasn't. That's that, uh, I've watched some, watched some highlights of this kid, and I say kid. For those of you who don't know about – Malawak, 7-2, South Sudan. His birthday, 18th birthday, is in September. So he is young. He's going to be like Tyrese Proctor when he entered Duke his freshman season. Yeah, there is raw talent, everyone says, but the wingspan is there, and you can see it when he plays his game. There is a fluidity to it. He's a big man who can also pass. If you're a fan of big men who can pass, and who doesn't love a big man who can pass? Let's not forget, uh, Jeremy Roach also hasn't made a decision on what he's planning on doing for next season. He has not. The question is, is that he, does he come back as the super duper senior because he has the one more year, or does he go get the bag somewhere else where he can showcase a little bit more? We just saw it happen with Caleb Love, right? Caleb Love at Carolina went to Michigan, couldn't get into Michigan for whatever transfer portal reasons, ends up at Arizona, ends up being conference player of the year there. Well, I'm glad and you brought show, and showcases his talent there. I'm glad you brought this up because my question is, and you kind of answered it just then. Okay. My question was, what reason does Jeremy Roach have to come back for Duke next season, other than what you just mentioned, just being the super duper senior? Like to me, Jeremy Roach coming back is a conversation that 
he has with John Shire as far as Shire saying, like, hey, I just need you to come back next year to really be a role model and a leader for these freshman guys coming in. Have the Be, be the anchor of anchor of anchors. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay, yeah, to be an anchor of the team. Right, but as – as we have seen in the last year and certainly last couple of years is the landscape has changed in college athletics. You know, sometimes you got to go get yours. Duke if, fans are if, making the joke right now. Well, Mondo Baycott played like six seasons at North Carolina. Well, and Jeremy Roach could do the exact same thing. And would that be great? I'm like, you can, you can have uh, guys out there lean into this just a little bit. You can never have too many tools, right? Sure. I'm like, I got a toolbox. I got wrenches. I haven't even touched. They're practically pristine. But that one time I need that wrench. I know I've got it. Jeremy Roach, I'm not saying he's the wrench, but it's great to have a lot of tools in that toolbox considering what you have coming in. A returning backcourt, a young front court that's going to establish itself very quickly based on expectation. Where the reality matches up to that is a different bit. I do not want to leave out a couple of other things ACC portal-wise. Andrew Carr decided that he's going to go to the portal. Wake Forest, big man. He has declared for the draft as well, leaving that door open. And then Dontres Styles, there's a name you all remember, right? When it ca- was at Carolina, used for a couple years very sparingly, ends up at Georgetown, okay? So he goes to Georgetown last year on a terrible basketball team. Like, he's like it for that team. But Styles is out there, and on three, one of their insiders is suggesting that Kinston's own could end up at State. This is Graham Hill's crystal ball prediction. I don't know anything, ladies and gentlemen, since he is a Kinston native. I do have a really good relationship. <laughs> what? There's something in the water. I do have a really good relationship with Dontre Styles. This is Graham Hill's crystal ball uh, decision. Uh, bookmark that. Mark that to happen. Sharpie pen. Sharpie, Sharpie pen. Sharpie, Graham Sharpie pen, Hill. Period. Call me ugly or call my baby ugly if it does not happen. But I, for the longest time, until North Carolina got involved, thought that Dontre Styles was 100% going to NC State just because Kevin Keats, I know a lot of coaches do this. I, there was three different times when I was still living in Kenton covering local high school sports when I was in community college. Kevin Keats on three separate occasions came to see Dontre Styles play once in just a conference matchup against Washington. Actually, I had the opportunity to interview Kevin Keats during halftime of that game. Big shout out to Kevin Keats, just the kind of guy he is. A second time he came during the inaugural MLK Classic when it was Dontre Styles versus Taquavion Smith, another name you guys might remember. That was a big matchup. And then a third time was a playoff matchup, actually Kenston versus Farmville Central again. And I believe it was the MLK Classic. Don Kevin Keats came to that game to see Dontre Styles play and Taquavion Smith as well after an NC State game that afternoon. Okay. Like that's how committed he was to trying to get – at least to one of those two guys to come play. Obviously, he got to Quavion Smith to come play for him that next season, but in the fall season, was committed hard or was recruited hard for Dontre Styles to come to Kansas. So, Graham Hill's crystal ball prediction, Dontre Styles, Dontre Styles goes to NZ State. Sharpie, period. Started all 32 games last year at Georgetown, 12-8 and 5-8. What a feather in the cap that would be for Kevin Keats, who already has Brandon Huntley-Hatfield coming in next year. It, uh, the, the, the thought is, is it's not going to last very long, but if uh, you believe Graham Hill, who uh, is just sitting just to the right of me, he'll make it happen. It'll happen. It'll happen. I'm Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 99.9 The Fan. After claiming their second consecutive ACC series on the road at Boston College this weekend, number 12 Wake Forest turns their attention to a midweek matchup with UNC Wilmington tonight at the Durham Bulls Athletic Park with the first pitch scheduled for 6 p.m. It's hockey night in Carolina as the Hurricanes conclude the regular season on the road against the Columbus Blue Jackets. Puck drop is at 7. Pre-game coverage begins at 6.30 with Stormwatch hosted by Adam Gold. After the game, be sure to check in to the Canes Corner Podcast live on 999 The Fans' YouTube channel with Adam Gold. The audio version will be made available tomorrow wherever podcasts can be found. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Do us a favor. Thank you. Find these stories and more on WRIOSportsFan.com. I don't quite go to this jam band version of jam band. <laughs> like that's what that was. Fleetwood right? Mac in the in the jam band category. 
I don't. I suppose so. Are they up there if with you the just dead? Listen to this. This is something you could listen to if you rolled out a blanket on the lawn. All right, this is very fair. Right. That's jam band for me. I heard this on my date night last night in Chapel Hill, and I was like, all right, I forgot about this. Forgot, forgot. about Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> and big Fleetwood Mac fans in Chapel Hill? Shout out to Carolina. Well, apparently at Carolina Brewery. Okay. Well, there you go. Is the beer good? Yes. Yeah, very. If you go, I would suggest the Copper Line Amber L. Okay, thank God you didn't say IPA. I'm not a big IPA I'm guy. I'm over IPAs. I've been over IPAs. I have friends who own brew pubs across this great country of ours. And they always, when I go, I go visit, and I have lots of homes across the country. Don't get me wrong. And I go visit, and they, hey, Paul, I just brewed up this brand new IPA, and I just look at them funny. And they it's just, hazy. They laugh at me, and they, and I, I go, guys, you know that's not my bit, right? I'm like, I'm patio beer guy. I'm like, I'm, I, and I love good amber ales. See, I'm only an IPA kind of guy if I'm trying to fit the scene of which an IPA would be presented. And to me, that's like a summertime pool party. Okay. See, I'm just not into the super hops. Like super hoppy. I mean, there have to be others like me, right? There have to be others like me who are just I'm IPA'd out. I go to the I go to the the craft beer aisles and whatnot. We are going to talk about Drake me. Uh, <laughs> I go to the craft Drake beer. Me. I go to the craft beer aisles and I see IPAs like left and right and left and right. And I'm just like, where? I'm like trying to go between all the the crazily named things and like that. Can I just get a, you know. Give me something I want. The only IPA I really like, and yeah, we'll get to Drake May after this. I'm just trying to plug in a local brewery here. I'll never turn down the R&D Brewing Seven Saturdays. Okay, fair. Big fan of that. Fair. I have I have so much Storm Brew at my house. Now, I'm not just saying Thank that because I look like the beer can for it right now with this shirt I'm wearing. Right. Okay, there you go. They could put a little logo on the side of you. Graham Hills NIL, everybody. Uh, USA Today has placed Drake May below the top three, right? The consensus is in the NFL draft that is coming next week in the first round next Thursday, if you can believe that. Again, April is just chugging along without any break. Caleb Williams is the number one pick. This doesn't feel like any sort of like out on a limb, big stretch. It's always about number two and number three. And when it comes to athleticism, it seems Jaden Daniels seems to be settling in as the number two. The number three guy in the USA Today mock that just came out is Michigan's J.J. McCarthy, where he has moved up. And McCarthy was there yesterday in New England, but Jared Mayo does like Drake May because he just has the tools, right? The prototypical NFL quarterback is Drake May. But instead of New England, where the prognosticators have them going, because number four Cardinals, unless they trade that, they're going Marvin Harrison, who is by far one of the most complete athletes around. Like, and he could understand and change an offense there that could all of a sudden have this depth and complexity that the Cardinals have lacked for several seasons because, let's be honest, Ron Dale Moore does not scare anybody at the wide receiver position. Number five is the L.A. Chargers, who USA Today has them trading out of and inserting the Minnesota Vikings to get Drake May. And Drake May, if it could not get any better for him, it would be one-time Panthers coach, now quarterbacks coach in Minnesota, Josh McCown, who coached May in high school in Charlotte. Hmm. And your top receiver, Justin freaking Jefferson. That is not a bad slide. That's not. That's, not, that's actually a really good combination with everything you just listed there. At all for Drake May. Some hometown ties for May from his high school football coach and then just having Justin Jefferson as your top wide receiver target, recipe for success. You're still a first-round pick. You don't end up, for May, you don't end up in New England, which, I mean, for Jared Mayo. It's going to be a rebuild. Right. Jared Mayo, I mean, they have Jacoby Brissett, former NC State, great. He's signed a one-year deal with the Patriots, was a Patriot, then not a Patriot, now a Patriot again. He's a bridge guy. The Patriots have... A lot of other needs besides building around a franchise quarterback. Would that help, though, Jared Mayo? Because we saw what happened in Houston, right? D'Amico Ryans? I mean, hello? You, you, he, walked, he walked into, you know, C.J. Stroud. high, And had the super season that he did. So, Dr- Jared Mayo's like, wait a second. Let's make sure I get somebody, too. Well, the somebody, at least in this case, would be J.J. McCarthy, who continues to rise up the boards because he can make throws and make pro-level decisions. That's what it is. It's not a knock against Drake May. It's just going by feel and how that's going to roll. Yesterday, USA Today, I mean, uh, WNBA, (laughs) the most anticlimactic draft in the history of draft, 
We know who was going number one, Caitlin Clark. There were three ACC players, by the way, selected. Daisha Fair of Syracuse, uh, Liz Kitley of Virginia Tech, who was the player of the year, but unfortunately uh, had the knee injury going into the postseason, which kind of took Virginia Tech out of the running for anything. She went in the second round, and then Kiki Jefferson of Louisville went in the third round. So three ACC players going. It's There are now household names in the WNBA. Whether you want to believe it, whether you hate women's sports, whether you enjoy women's sports, there are now household names there. But what did they do with them? It's unclear if the leadership can do something with them. At least they had certainly had tried, and at least this year, for the first year ever, they actually sold tickets to the WNBA draft, of which, you know, it was a modest room, but still, they were able to sell tickets. UConn head coach Gina Oriema says the WNBA needs to market those stars much better. The WNBA hasn't had the benefit of these great players that have come along They didn't have the following. They didn't have the hysteria that these kids have. So there wasn't a, I want to follow them. So hopefully this will change that narrative. But the WNBA is going to have to do a great job of marketing these guys. The WNBA, I don't think, has done a great great enough job of marketing their individual stars for whatever reason, because there's been a lot of them. And maybe now I think it'll change. So build up some rivalries, right? Create the rivalries, whether they are factual, whether they are just on paper. It's going to have to come at some point for this league to take that next step and capitalize on what women's college basketball did. Cameron Brink, Stanford, uh, she, re- she reminds me of Lisa Leslie back in the day. WNBA, Harold the Pick, played ball also. And let's be honest, we call it what it is. She also looks good on camera. She's 6'3", has ties to Steph Curry. Like they knew each other as little kids. Like you cannot do much more than that. Camila Cardoso, 6'7", out of Brazil, an international player. Angel Reese, a Final Four most outstanding player, pick number seven. There are names now that you can lean in beyond Caitlin Clark. And Caitlin Clark's going to stir this drink. Trust me, it's going to happen. And Gino, he's right. They need to market the stars better.